I'm Matt. I'm Mel. I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is episode 22, an episode like the one we did on Clive Barker that we are calling a Master of Horror. We'll return to our normal format in the fall, but for the summer we thought we'd relax and enjoy some good old-fashioned horror. We also have some big things planned for our next full season of the No Fear cast. You can help by leaving us a review on iTunes or, or by donating to our Patreon, but we'll have more on that at the end of the episode. So right now, sit back and relax as we introduce you to the master of horror, Ira Levin. In his book on horror, Dance Macabre, Stephen King wrote this about Ira Levin. Every novel he has written has been a marvel of plotting. He is the Swiss watchmaker of the suspense novel. In terms of plot, he makes what the rest of us do look like those $5 watches you can buy in the discount drugstores. Those are pretty high words of praise from the king of horror. And some of you may know exactly who we're talking about when we start talking about Ira Levin. Some of you may have started listening to this podcast with no idea who this master of horror was, and you may be scratching your heads. I promise you, though, when I tell you a little bit about what he wrote and what he did, you're going to know exactly who I'm talking about and why we decided to devote this episode to Mr. Levin. So just a little bit about him. He was born in 1929 and he died a few years back in 2007. But in his in his writing career, he wrote several novels including and you'll you'll notice a few familiar titles here. Rosemary's Baby in 1967, which of course was adapted into the film in 1968. Stepford Wives in 1972, again, it was made into a popular horror film in 1975, remade again in 2004. But he also wrote a couple other ones that I would say fall maybe more into the thriller or mystery genres, maybe more than pure horror. A Kiss Before Dying in 1953, The Perfect Day. 1970. The Boys from Brazil, 1974. That was also made into a film. I've heard it's very good. I haven't seen it yet, but that's been on my list for a while. Sliver in 1991. And Son of Rosemary, which was written in 1997 as a sequel to Rosemary's Baby. He won, of course, numerous awards, three Edgar Awards by the Mystery Writers of America. He also won that Grand Master Award in 2003. And he actually won a Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement. That's put out by the Horror Writers Association. So he was somebody who has done a lot to, I guess, establish horror as we understand it today. In fact, if you look at a lot of the books, especially that came out in the late 60s, early 70s, almost any horror paperback that you picked up during that time had some sort of reference on it to one of Levin's novels. So something along the lines of, if you liked Rosemary's Baby, you're going to love this book. Or if you like Stepford Wives, you're going to love this book. And so it's hard... I think even to separate the genre work that came out in the decades after his works, like that's, that's how influential this man was and in his writing. But in addition, he also wrote some plays, including death trap, which came out in 1978 and it's described as a comedy thriller. It was nominated for a Tony award, but it has the distinction of being the longest running thriller on Broadway And that was also made into a film in 1982, which starred Michael Caine and Christopher Reeve. So he wasn't just a novelist, but he dabbled in a few other things. I believe there were a couple of uh, television episodes that he wrote. But again, probably what most of our listeners here 
would be most interested in or perhaps know him the best for are his two books, Rosemary's Baby and Stepford Wives. Yeah, Lisa, when you were talking about his uh, breadth of writing, um, I don't want to take us too far away from his horror writing, obviously, because we are a horror podcast, but his ability to write in different genres, and I'm talking like genres we think of it now, like sci-fi, you know, horror, that sort of thing, but also genres and format is pretty amazing. And he, he actually started in drama when, uh, in like the late forties, early fifties, mid fifties, he was writing, uh, scripts for training films for the military and for a, a company, I believe. And his first produced play was actually no time for sergeants in 1956, he adapted it from the novel by Mac Hyman. And of course, if you get, if anyone's familiar with the movie No Time for Sergeants, which became a movie and then a TV show later, it was initially kind of a vehicle for Andy Griffith's acting career. And he also wrote lyrics to music. Um, he did a play with music in it. And he also wrote the lyrics to the Barbara Streisand song, He Touched Me. And even within his horror, he often would kind of mash up genres. I was reading Stepford Wives in preparation for this episode. I'd watched the remake, but I had never read the book. And there's there's sci-fi in, in that book with the kind of the robotic aspect to what's going on with these women, um, which was changed, of course, in later iterations on the screen. But yeah, he was masterful at mystery and thriller, but could also do like horror with demon possession and everyday kind of ordinary life horror and also sometimes even throw a sci-fi aspect in. I mean, he, he seemed to be able to do relatively well at anything he would put his pen to, I think is what I'm saying. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still <laughs> I'm still a little gobsmacked by the fact that he wrote lyrics to a Barbara Streisand song. <laughs> Yeah, I had to look that up a couple times when I saw that pop up because I was like, what? <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> well, it certainly does kind of, it, it, it really, I guess, kind of exemplifies what you're saying that he, anything that he put his pen to or that he sat, it's almost like he just sat down and was like, I'm, I'm going to write these things and they're going to be successful. And they were. He had a bit of that Midas touch when it came when it came to words and music and but I, I do think there's something really interesting, Mel, about what you were saying about how easily he could flow between genres because it, especially if you look at Stepford Wives, that one especially, I do I almost think about that more as resting in in the sci-fi, as you said, than actually horror. I mean, what happens within Stepford Wives? is horrific and the ending is certainly horrific and just the, the entire idea is horrifying. Um, but I still think of that more as science fiction than anything else. But then you look at Rosemary's baby and that seems to be such a, um, it's so firmly based in, in the horror genre and it pays such close attention to certain expectations within the genre itself that it's hard to argue that it's anything other than horror. But then you look at that next to some of his others, you know, A Kiss Before Dying, which, I mean, that's pretty much pure suspense, maybe thriller, you, you could say, or The Boys from Brazil, or even Sliver, which, if I remember right, is an erotic thriller. So they're all very different in tone. And I'm wondering, what is it that you think, besides just being enormously successful and well done, do you think ties these all together? Or, or can you pinpoint something that makes them specifically Levin? I think I agree. Uh, unfortunately, I have not read all of his his books. But the ones that I've read and the the movies I've seen... I feel like Stephen King kind of really hits a nail on the head that his books are just so intricately plotted, at least the ones that I read, but you don't see it. Like there are no seams, but from the very first page of Rosemary's Baby, when they're going to look at this building that they really want to live in from then meeting their neighbors on, you don't even really have to know much about Rosemary's Baby going into that book that the suspense is just slowly boiling and ratcheting up. And I know we've we've talked, Lisa, prior to this episode about I, I have some thoughts about how the book ends versus how the movie ends. 
because sometimes I think when you ratchet up suspense and put it together so so expertly, the end is is can be rough because it's got to stop at some point. But Stepford Wives too is literally it's with the robotic ass, the Disney robotic aspect. I always feel like Watchmaker is perfect. It's like the gears just keep turning, and the way that one ends with its ambiguity is so perfect. Like you think you know what happens at the end of it, but it's left hanging, and I just keep thinking about that ending. And I think that, yeah, I mean, if you say suspense. And maybe even ambiguity has to pop into your mind. I mean, uh, Death Trap, which I have not seen the film of Death Trap, though I've heard that that becomes like a postmodern maze, basically, which it should be because the way it's written is kind of like a postmodern maze where it's a play within a play within a play. I mean, your head almost starts hurting as you keep trying to solve the murder mysteries and then trying to figure out how it relates to the actual writing of what you're reading and which play you're reading. It is such a masterful take just on how thrillers are constructed even. Yeah, and I don't know. I feel like that that suspense or that construction of the the slowly like putting a frog in a pot and bringing it up to a boil. Like you're uncomfortable and you're uncomfortable and you're uncomfortable and you know something's going to happen. It's very difficult to do that really well, I think. And he does he does it for me. Yeah, I think that's a good point, especially if we're talking about Levin and and any sort of style or tone that may connect all of his works. I think that idea of, and and I guess to piggyback on yours and and Stephen King's analogy here, but of the watch and the gears within the watch, everything moves together so fluidly. But at the same time, once he starts turning that crank of suspense, he doesn't let off of it. And it's, it's a very, I hate the term slow burn, so I'm not going to use it, <laughs> but um, it, it's a very slow tightening, I'll say, of, of tension throughout his works. And you just, you can, you can look at large chunks. For instance, I'm going to use Rosemary's Baby because that's one of my favorites of his. And I haven't read everything. I'll go ahead and put that out there. I want to. He's an author that I would love to just read every word he's put on the page, but with Rosemary's Baby, which is one of my favorites, there are large chunks of that book in the movie, too. And he even says at one point, Levin made the comment that he thought it was an absolutely faithful adaptation. And Mel, we can talk about the film in a minute, um, because I know you had some ideas on the, on the two endings that I definitely want to get to. But, you know, Levin thought that the the movie was perfect. And I think this is one one place where I can really agree with him that Polanski did a really great job adapting it. I I still wonder what would have happened had William Castle gotten to do it the way he, he had originally wanted to, because he really championed this book and getting it turned into a movie and kind of got the rug pulled out from under him at the last minute when it, when it was given to Roman Polanski. But the adaptation was absolutely pitch perfect because there are, there are such large chunks of the plot where nothing happens, you know, mm-hmm. and you're, we're watching Rosemary in her apartment by herself, or we're watching Rosemary wander the streets of New York by herself. <laughs> and yet there is so much tension behind every movement that she makes and everything that she does. And it just builds up to this fever pitch by the end that there's almost nowhere to go. I mean, really, the only thing I can compare it to in contemporary film is that movie The Witch. That had a very Levin-esque feel, I guess, to it because of the way it, it tightened the tension, working up to the climax there. But... That's what he was so good at. And I, and I wish I could see, but as you said, he's so seamless in how he puts it all together that it's difficult to see how he's even doing it. It's more of just a feeling that the reader or the viewer has as they're experiencing something that he wrote. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think <laughs> while you were talking, I was reminded that while I was reading Rosemary's Baby, I actually texted you, if I remember correctly, something to the effect of, I'm reading Rosemary's Baby, nothing is happening and I'm terrified. <laughs> And it's 
like, I wish I had an actual example to point to. I feel bad that I did not pull out a quote, but there are these moments when somebody says something or she hears something like when she, when she first hears the older couple, the second, the second time they hear the older couple talking through the bedroom wall and she's slightly asleep and dreaming at the same time. And you realize that it's the older couple talking about what happened to Terry, their, the girl that they were going to use for their satanic experiments. But she, she doesn't know that, which I thought they did relatively well in the movie. I was like, how the heck are they going to do these hallucinatory space, uh, spaces in the text? Um, and it, it worked. But in the book, it's like, as the audience or the reader, I mean, there's the dramatic irony, which I guess a playwright would be really good at, right? Like, you as the audience are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why is Guy doing that? Why does she think this? Or why does she hear that? Or what's happening here? And uh, she, uh, she's not uh, that she's dumb. Like you completely believe her. She's just going about her normal everyday life. It's very Shirley Jackson esque. Like she's just trying to live her life and have a baby, and <laughs> you make a family for herself. And all this horrible evil is going on just on the other side of her supposedly normal apartment wall. And yeah, I mean, there, there's that kind of horror. I think is very effective. Oh, and just a quick shout out about William Castle. If you listeners, if you haven't listened to our Patreon Masters of Horror ep on Castle, we actually talk a little bit in that one about his Hitchcock like appearance in Rosemary's Baby. He's the producer of the movie, and he's the man that she's worried about when he's in the when she's in the phone booth trying to get a hold of uh, Doctor Hill. So he he did appear in the movie, even if he didn't have any role other than production. But I, I mean, Lisa, do you agree with the Shirley Jackson comparison there? This kind of like her everyday life is getting screwed up by this supernatural activity. Yeah. And, you know, I wouldn't have made that connection, but when, when, when you said that, I was nodding <laughs> as you were talking because it is completely true. And something else that is very Shirley Jackson esque about his writing or, or that, that really fits within what she did as well is the paranoia of the outside versus the, almost unhomely aspect of the home and how the home can become a threatening space because so many of, I mean, just to use probably the one that most people are familiar with when you say Shirley Jackson is you just have to mention the short story, the lottery. And that that's a perfect example of you have these outsiders who are very threatening and that slowly comes from the outside and works its way into the home where suddenly the members of your family are the ones turning against you and, and your once safe place isn't safe anymore. And that's exactly what happens in both Rosemary's Baby and Stepford Wives. And I think that may be as close as at least I can get to the source of the tension because, you know, you look at Rosemary's Baby, of course there's a supernatural aspect and it's a very real one. And you know, she has moved, <laughs> she has moved next door to a bunch of Satan worshipers who are hoping to use her as um, an incubator for their dark Lord. <laughs> so <laughs> Adrian, <laughs> yeah, you, you would think that that would be, that that would be the source of the tension, right? And it is, but then you look at what's happening actually within her apartment and you have her, her relationship with her husband guy. To me, that was the worst betrayal of the book is you realize as a reader, I think I'm pretty sure before Rosemary does that guy has basically sold his wife to these people, you know, that he's wanted this perfect acting career. Things weren't going his way. And so, Hey, use my wife, use my firstborn and, give me what I want kind of makes a deal with the devil or sells his soul or whatever happened there. And I think that is what is so frightening because especially in the very beginning, Rosemary is looking to him to help explain all the things that she can't explain these strange dreams she's having. And, and of course being a young pregnant woman out there, are all these changes with her hormones and her body and she doesn't, she doesn't know what's normal and what's not at that point. And he should be her source of stability and her kind of guiding force. And he's not. He's the one who's who has kissed her on the cheek for for his bag of silver, so to speak. And and it's kind of the same way in Stepford Wives, because 
you know, at that point, the main character who I'm blinking on her name right now doesn't realize what her husband is doing. And at first she just thinks it's something strange about the neighborhood that she's moved into. And it's not till later on. And again, I will, I will jump out and say that it's, I think the reader probably realizes it before the main character in this one too, which may help the tension tighten so well. But it, it's that these characters realize something is wrong outside before they realize something is wrong inside. And so it's kind of the multi-layered threat that works really well. And you're right, Shirley Jackson did the same thing. Yeah, I agree with you that it's the mix of the internal and the external threat. And also, there's interesting, and and also making the home the creepy place of horror. Like, you think you're safe in your new apartment, you know, and it's your neighbor, it's your husband who's going to betray you. I was struck, you know, especially reading Rosemary's Baby and Stepford Wives relatively close to each other, the the kind of gender issues or portrayal, which I think there's a quotation from Betty Friedan at the beginning of Stepford Wives. I want to say that is the epigraph. But there's this, like, Stepford Wives is basically a reaction to, you know, the women had the women's group. And so then all of a sudden the men kind of turn the tables on them. And then her, you know, the woman, the main character and her husband show up and, and they get sucked into this. Rosemary's baby, I thought was kind of interesting as well, in that the mistreatment of Rosemary while she's undergoing what you're talking about, like she wants to have this baby and she's pregnant and there's all these like women's, like there's all these health issues that she's having and they just keep poo-pooing them in reality because her doctor is in on it and wants the child of Satan to be born. But I just thought it was so interesting that Rosemary as a woman wasn't really being paid attention to or listened to or helped. And she was like, it's almost like an abusive relationship. Like she's being isolated. Guy won't let her talk to her female friends. The evil elderly couple, you know, are constantly barging in and wanting to know who she's talking to and stopping her communication with people. This kind of abusive isolation I thought was really interesting to the point where right when you start to realize Guy's evil, he actually says to Rosemary, when he apologizes to her for being a selfish person, he says, I've been so worried about my career. I totally forgot about about yours. Let's have a baby. It's like, what? Uh, like my mind was blown there. And, and the, 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 the kind of 1950s, 60s treatment of Rosemary couched within the supernatural stuff, I thought was intriguing. In addition to that slow buildup of suspense. And these women aren't necessarily victims per se. They figure out what's happening. They try to protect themselves, but it's like everything all around them is falling in upon them. And they, they're so isolated by the end that there's, there's nothing they can do. Right. Um, you're ab- absolutely right. And, and he really had had a fingertip on the pulse of, of, I guess, the gender politics of of the day. And that is one of the things that I do love about Rosemary's Baby is, because as we talked about kind of, I guess, the multiple layers of threat, you want to look at the Satanist in or the Satanic cult in the apartment building, or you want to look at her husband. And her husband does everything he can to isolate her, and they do choose her doctor, and he's in on it. And so you kind of feel like, well, she's trapped. But she makes several attempts to escape her situation, one of them being when her friends throw her the baby shower. Mm-hmm. And they are telling her, this is not right. And they try to get her help. And, that, and of course, her husband steps in, and that's when he cuts, really cuts her off. But there's that one scene, and I know I'm not the only one to come up with this. I I honestly can't remember where I read it the first time. But there's the scene where she does escape, and she makes it to the hospital. And for a moment, it seems like she's free. Like, she could actually get away. She could possibly maybe go home. You know, there's talk about her family still being in the Midwest and— I I believe in the book there's a lot to do with the fact that her family was a really strong Catholic family, which kind of plays into the whole gender politics of who she's supposed to be. You know, she's supposed to be the wife and the mother and this good girl. And the fact that she, as the good Catholic girl, is is wrapped up in all this is adds an extra layer, I think, of terror for some people. But when she's at the hospital, she's with a doctor who knows nothing of this satanic cult. He's not a part of it. And at that point, that that 
doctor could step in and save her. But instead, what does he do? He basically says, you're hysterical, and he calls her husband and says, come pick her up. Yeah, yeah, precisely. And, yeah, yeah and, that, and that's kind of the idea of, okay, if you, if you erase her husband, her abusive husband, if you erase the satanic cult, this woman is still in danger. You know, she still is finding people who aren't believing her, who aren't helping her, and who are actively trying to imprison her, because that's essentially what he does, is he sends her back to her captors. And the, uh, the way he does it, and, and especially in the movie, I remember it really vividly, because he just kind of walks in, he's in the room very briefly, and you think, okay, here he is, he could save her, and he just... Okay, nope, calling your husband by and leaves. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. doesn't even give her a chance to defend herself or, or to explain really what's been going on and explain that she's not hysterical, that she's not crazy, that she's not suffering some sort of paranoid delusion. Yeah, I mean, it, when you really start to think about it, because it seems like such, and maybe this is where, where Levin was such a genius. It seems like such a simple story. Woman is impregnated by Satan. (laughs) I mean, how many times have we seen that movie or read that story? But there are so many different levels to this. I I love it. Well, and it's also just ambiguous enough that at least until the end, you literally could go every each way on her. I mean, I think we're drawn to believe her because we're seeing the isolation and the way she's being treated. And yeah, Doctor, the Doctor Hill character not believing her is just like that is the final kind of straw that breaks the camel's back and like people not helping this poor woman. But I think the the brilliant way that he handles the ambiguity up until maybe that end is just so interesting to me because as a reader, we can kind of go both ways. Like we start figuring out before her, but it also is like, Oh, this is almost like too conspiracy theory. Like it's almost too perfect. It's almost too pat. But again, like going back to Shirley Jackson, like that's the horror of the everyday, right? Like you don't know who lives next door to you. Maybe there are satanic conspiracies. (laughs) Like the the impossible could be possible. And that's, what's terrifying because he presents her situation. If it was real, like, and I'm saying a big, if listeners don't think I've lost, my mind. She would have a very hard time getting help, right? Because we don't want to believe these sorts of things, you know? And so uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting right. book. Yeah, and, and it, it is. And, you know, we might as well talk about the ending of the book and the film because he does answer it for us. And, you know, he doesn't leave us hanging in this kind of ambiguity. I mean, I guess you could sort of, if you really wanted to push it, that it's still as ambiguous, but I, you know, he, he pretty much gives us the answer by the end, but he waits until the very, very end of it, you Mm -hmm. know, where you're really wondering, okay, well, is Rosemary having some sort of breakdown? I mean, here you have this small town Catholic girl living in New York city an actor husband she seems to bend to him very easily, <laughs> you know, just kind of go with whatever he wants. She's very eager to play that role of dutiful wife and doting mother. And, you know, she's not somebody, you know, in Stepford Wives, the women seem to push back a little bit more against those roles. And of course, it was written five years later. And so that that may have something to do with the changing of the times. But they do push back against those roles a little bit harder. And and they have more of what I would consider real relationships with their husbands where they have a voice and they have opinions and they're willing to go get help if they need it. And Rosemary is not that type of woman. And so it's very easy to look at somebody like her and think, okay, well, here's just this mousy little woman. She is hallucinating. She has finally succumb to everything she's been told in her life. And, you know, I suppose she's been told her whole life that the devil's out to get her and now she's convinced it's really true. And even though there, there are moments in both the book and the movie where you get glimpses that she's not that person, that there's somebody deeper within her, like when she chops off all her hair in that wonderful moment, (laughs) but you know, she does fit that. And so you do go back and forth throughout 
throughout the plot of wondering, is this all in her head or is this really happening? As you said, how well do you really know your neighbors? How well do you really even know your spouse? How well can you really know some, somebody else? But in the end, he does answer it, right? He answers that question for us. And then she decides she's going to be the mother of Satan, which I still am not quite sure if I go with that. I mean, I guess she's really wanted a baby, so go for it. Like I told you, I, I, I almost feel like the end of the movie is a little bit better and that we see her look at the baby and show the terror on her face. We don't actually look at it. Like the actual looking at the baby ended the suspense for me. Yeah, it didn't quite go absur- to absurd, but the the description of him and his markings of Satan and his red hair and all that, I was just almost like, I don't know. It, it's like when you when you anticipate the monster the whole movie, and then you see it, you're like, really? And that was kind of what I felt. And then the whole like, well, I'll just be the mother of Satan. And then they're all like worshiping her. I was a little bit kind of, I don't know. I, I just the book cooked, and then I got to the end, and I was like, okay. But the end of the movie, because it left you hanging a little bit more, I I felt like I felt like that for me, that energy and that suspense was held more. Does that make sense? As opposed to actually seeing the baby. I don't know. How did you feel about it? No, I I completely agree. I mean, I I think I think the the ending of the book went into a little bit. I mean, I'm fine that he ended it that way and, and. didn't leave it ambiguous. Sometimes ambiguous endings frustrate me too much to actually like enjoy what they're doing. So I I appreciate that, that he went ahead and said, no, this, this was something supernatural that was happening. And it it was kind of nice, almost an empowerment of Rosemary because she'd step forward and kind of fulfill her role. In fact, if we're going to keep going with the Shirley Jackson analogies, it's very much like Eleanor in The Haunting of Hill House, you know, by the end, where she's kind of accepting the end of the journey. Oh, yeah. It's also raising demons, literally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, visually, I like what Polanski did with the end of Rosemary's Baby, because you do, you see her, okay, she's going to accept her role of mother, and then she looks into this bassinet that's nicely draped with black velvet, and, you know, very clearly was made for the spawn of Satan. And uh, she looks at her son, and there is this look of horror. And the look, I would much rather see the look on her face than actually see what the baby physically looks like, because I think he does in the movie with the demon eyes. But that's all yes. we see of the baby, yeah. or or are the baby's eyes, and it 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 is much more satisfying as a horror fan to see the look of horror on her face, and then let my imagination fill in the rest than it is to see it played out in the book. And I'm going to go ahead and and make another comparison to that movie, The Witch, because that that's something that. I think I experienced when I watched that and I won't go into too much detail for those who haven't had a chance since it's a newer movie. I mean, if you haven't seen Rosemary's baby by this point, sorry, (laughs) but since the witch is a little bit newer, I can see now how the filmmaker really owed a lot to Levin and especially Rosemary's baby, because throughout that plot, you're constantly wondering how much of this is something supernatural that's happening and how much of it is the de- religious delusions, I guess, of the father. And either way, there's danger, kind of like for Rosemary. If she is crazy and paranoid and pregnant, there is still a lot of danger there for her. There is very real danger the same as if there's something supernatural, there's very real danger there as well. And I think, and again, maybe that's why it works so well on a suspense level, because as a reader or as a viewer, you don't know, you don't know which way it's going to play out, but you know, either way is not going to be good. There's really no happy ending that's coming in any of these stories. And and the witch, again, I won't spoil it, although most of you probably already know what happened. That film takes a very strong stance in the end, you know, is it supernatural? Is it not? And it, and it, and it answers the question for you. But again, I don't know if there was going to be a good 
a good ending at all. It's kind of for, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about that? Oh, how to, how to end Rosemary's baby. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, while, you know, while I was saying that I think that the end of the movie is better than the end of the book, I totally understand why he ended the book the way he did. Cause I mean, you can't, as it goes, they are acting weirder and weirder. I mean, if there's no, if they weren't Satanists, they wouldn't have sneaked into the apartment. They wouldn't be holding her down. They wouldn't be drugging her. Like their their evil intentions, whether they whether Satan's real or whatever, you know, are pretty evident by the end. I, from Guy's betrayal and allowing her to be raped to the end, where she knows that her baby is alive and it's been taken from her. When she, if she goes in that apartment, she's either got to see nothing, and they take the knife away from her and put her in a hospital or she has to see the baby and and i think her religion is they use it in some ways to kind of victimize her but in some ways i think you're right that her identity as who she is and wanting to be a mother and having had this child and choosing to be a mother in the end kind of comes out i mean she chooses to be the mother at the end of the movie too there's just not all the worshiping of her that there is at the end of the book on the other hand i think that's the problem with any book ending right it's almost impossible to get it perfect because we're always going to want more we're always going to want to know more and we're always going to, you know, either be surprised or have expected it the whole time. And so you've, you've got, as a creator, you have to make a choice. So I don't know. I can understand both endings. I just, for me, the movie ending, leaving a little bit more open, like not actually seeing the child worked a little bit better for me. But maybe it's just a visual aspect. Because while I was reading Rosemary's Baby, I was almost seeing it in my head. He's a very he's a very visual writer. And so maybe that's why the movie worked a little bit better for me there at the end. Yeah, he does write as almost, even in his novels, you can see the playwright coming out in his work. Just in the way he stages, you know, her apartment, for instance, in Rosemary's Baby or the neighborhood in Stepford Wives. I still remember the the main meeting hall where all the men would go at night. And yeah, he is a very visual writer and I can see how, how his works are so easily adapted to film just, just from that standpoint alone. I was just going to say, Lisa, we were talking about the ending of Rosemary's baby. What did you think of the way he ended Stepford wives, the book, because that is, I mean, it's not ambiguous because you know that the men have taken her to her best friend. So the best friend will kill her. But he actually doesn't show it to you. So at the end, you still, there's a possibility that maybe Bobby really is going to prick herself and show that she bleeds. But at the same time, the music is playing really loudly. I mean, it, it, I think in some ways it's obvious that she's about to be murdered, but he doesn't show us as opposed to showing us the child. I mean, do you think that obviously we can't get inside someone's head, but did that work better for you? Why do you think he decided to leave that pocket open there? I don't know. That may be one of those instances where an ambiguous ending does work really well. And I may just, so I've read Rosemary's baby again, most recently. And so it's been a couple of years since I've read Stepford wives and I've seen both film versions. And so I will admit that they're all kind of getting a bit jumbled in my head as far as the endings. But I feel like that's what didn't work. I'll say this. That's what didn't work about the most recent remake of Stepford Wives. Who was in that? Nicole Kidman and... Oh, the guy from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah. And was it Nicole Kidman? It was, yeah. And uh, Bette Midler. Bette Bette Midler. Midler was the best friend, yeah. Right. And, and Bette Midler was fantastic in that role because I remember thinking that was almost who I had imagined in my head when I read the book, um, that that type of big personality. And and the ending of that is is they, they took that ambiguity away completely because it ends showing her having been replaced you know, well, I take I, I take that back. I, <clears throat> the book does show her being replaced at the end, but we don't we don't see how. Like we don't know if she was ki- like another woman sees her in a supermarket and she's different. But there's a gap between the possible killing of her and her, there's no they don't show her being killed or roboticized. If that makes well, sense. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, <laughs> I apologize to any 
<laughs> listeners out there who maybe have read the book more recently than I have because I'm probably getting things wrong. And I saw the movie when it came out. So that's like, what, 12 years? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I haven't Gone. seen the remake since. Yeah, it came out in 2004 and I saw it in the theater and I haven't seen it since. Um, and, I, and I've seen the 1975 film a few times as well. But I'm trying to think of the book and separate that in my head. And this is what is proving difficult. But if I remember right. A few things that were different, especially from Rosemary's Baby, that he did just slightly differently, since they are kind of dealing with similar themes. You are never clear on how the wives are being replaced, right? No. I mean, she has a really good idea. But yeah, because they leave that gap, she's like, something's about to happen. And then all of a sudden, she's been changed. But you don't know how assume she's being killed and replaced by a robot or something along those lines, but it could be a kind of body snatcher type thing where she is still alive and is somehow taken over, I guess. But what is really interesting is she seems to have a real ally in her best friend who of course is taken before her. And that's where the kind of horror aspect of it comes up because she sees her friend changing before her eyes and becoming something that was such a well-written character. But if I'm remembering right, she had a pretty decent relationship with her husband. Yeah. They were really equal about the housework and with the bringing up of the children and he's very present. Right. And so there, there he's less like guy where Guy sells Rosemary out so early in the book (laughs) that we don't trust as the reader anything that Guy does from that point on. But I I feel like it was Stepford Wives because she did have such equal, an equal relationship with her husband that I almost wondered how her husband was really going to do that to her. You know, how he was really going to, you know, what was he getting if he sold his wife And replaced her for for this other model. Because it seems like he really enjoyed who she was. And that opened up a lot of ambiguity and questions for me as a reader. That I think some of the movies tried to answer a little bit. I don't think they did it well. But I always kind of wondered. I was like, well, surely he's not going to do this. So I thought, well, maybe they've done something to him. You know? Or maybe he's... He's just going to take her in and then they're going to figure out some way to make everybody think she's been replaced. And and like you said, it's that gap in time that gives you that ability to read into it what you want. But again, I'm kind of kicking myself for not having read it over the weekend now. (laughs) It's really fast. I've read it more recently than you have, though. It's been a long time since I saw the remake movie. But I was I thought it was interesting that he left that gap there. But talking about the husband. Yeah, I mean, even when because I read it more recently, I know, you know, I I remember how he kind of approached it in the end. He pushed it off on the other men to capture her. And then the other men basically, you know, let her robotic friend be the one to, to kill her. I mean, that's the application. She has this huge knife at the end and they're in the room alone. And then the, her newest friend, the, the, an African American family moves to town and she becomes friends with, with that woman who's a children's book writer. And she sees uh, the main character in the supermarket and realizes something weird's going on. She's actually going to try to save that woman and escape when they catch her. But one of the just uber creepy things to me in Stepford Wise that I remember from reading that was not just the husband seeming like a more likable person than Guy, but after her best friend is changed, she, the main character, goes to her best friend's oldest son and asks him if he's noticed that there's a change in his mother. And he says, oh, yeah, you know, she's keeping the house clean. She co- She's cooking great. She's taking care of herself. She's not yelling at me anymore. And he's like, it's great. I hope she never goes back to the way she was. And it was just so blasé. And like innocent, but it was also cruel at the same time. And the the turn there, I thought, was so interesting. Like this kid does not know that his mom is dead and is a robot, but to him, because he's getting the bonuses, you know, of having this woman's personality kind of gone, 
he's just like, well, I'm glad she's not nagging at me anymore. And like the innocence and the the horror of that all at the same time was kind of blood curdling. And right. it's those little moments that hit you. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And that and that's where when we were talking about the beginning, how he can so fluid fluidly go across the lines of genre. Because here you have I mean, we've been talking about robots <laughs> this whole time up to this point, and we're firmly in science fiction territory. And then you talk about something like that. And I had forgotten that part of the book, but I remember now as you're describing it, and it was, it's exactly as you said, it was a blood curdling moment because she was such a well, well written character. I wanted her to be my best friend. You know, she was funny. She was irreverent. If, I, if I'm remembering right, she, she was a, a really strong feminist and she was smart and well-read and she was the type of person that, yeah, she had a messy house. Yes, she, she dressed a little sloppy, <laughs> you know. Um, she was a real person. She was a real person and she was somebody that you would want to sit down and have a cup of coffee with. And that's exactly why was Bobby is that the main character the main character the friend is Bobby Bobby is okay the main character was like Joanne Joanna maybe yeah I think it was Joanna Joanna okay uh we'll go with that but that that's why she befriends somebody like Bobby is because she is such an interesting person and and it's it's the it's the quirks and it it's the messy parts and it's the things that don't quite go as they should that make a person interesting. And that's what makes them memorable. And, and I think that that's what you're getting at is it's so heartbreaking because the husbands know what they're doing. I mean, the husbands are pretty disgusting in this book. Um, Pretty, pretty gross, <laughs> you know, just, just wanting a robot that will do a mindless robot that will do what they want. But it's, it's, as you said, the children, because as a mother myself, I want my children to appreciate who I am as a person. And as they grow older to get to know me as a friend, like once I'm out of the parent role for them and it would be devastating if they would prefer a robot who just cooked and cleaned and smiled as opposed to me, who is sometimes messy and sometimes does yell <laughs> and probably nags at them more than I'd like to admit. But I'm a real person and I want them to see that. I want them to see my personality and who I am and what I have to offer other than I can put clean sheets on your bed and deliver a cooked meal every night. So yeah, there is a real horror in that. And, and it probably has something to say too about the gender roles and and. and what we want and what we expect. And Mel, I, I think all these, this whole discussion about Rosemary's baby and Stepford Wise and, and just how brilliant he was at, at having a, a pulse on, on the changing times that he lived in. And it just kind of proves what kind of genius he was and, and how well he knew humanity. And I think that's why today we're still talking about him because honestly, and I won't do this to you listeners, but I could keep going for another couple of hours just talking about Stepford Wives and Rosemary's Baby. But he did hit a nerve with that. You know, you had books that came out, Stepford Husbands and what look what's happened to Rosemary's Baby. And, and these were things that were not written by him, but that were spawned, I guess, from his ideas. And yeah, there's just so much that we can talk about with Ira Levin. And I hope that you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed talking about it. <laughs> and we really want to keep doing this, um, bringing you masters of horror and introducing you to maybe the, the creators of some of your favorite horror works that you may not have known about. But here's where we need your help. We want you to write us on the website or on our social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and tell us which master of horror that you're dying to know about. We've already done a mini episode on director William Castle. So if you didn't know that little tidbit about William Castle's connection to Rosemary, 
uh, Rosemary's Baby. We have already done that episode, and that was exclusive for our Patreon listeners. So if that's something that interests you, you may really like some of these mini episodes that we're, we're offering up to Patreon listeners. They come out in our off weeks, the weeks we don't have these main episodes. So please consider donating if that's something that sounds interesting to you. It's less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So we've got really big plans for the future. Things that include interviews. There are things that we need to travel to that we're really hoping we can bring you. And Patreon supporters really keep us going. If that's not something you can do at this time, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes because it helps others, listeners find us. And we are so thankful for everyone who has taken the time to review us already. So if you haven't left us a review, we'd love to hear from you. See you next time. This is the No Fear Podcast. You can find us online at Twitter and Instagram at NoFearCast. That's K-N-O-W FearCast. Or our website, NoFearCast.com. If you want to contact us, send us an email to NoFearCast at gmail.com. Download us through iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere else podcasts are found. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Or you can support us on Patreon. Supporters get special perks such as early access to our main episodes and exclusive mini-episodes released on the weeks in between our normal schedule, depending on the tier you choose. Even a little bit makes a big difference. The No Fear Cast. We know what scares you. This is a personal project and not related to any academic institution.